This will be the first in a series of two lectures on moral law. We saw in the lectures on the moral government of God that there are two kinds of laws in the universe. At least all laws can be put into one of the other of these two categories. They're physical law and moral law. Engineering and physics and chemistry and medicine are made up primarily of physical laws. But God doesn't govern man in the realm of right and wrong or morality by cause and effect. So he does it by moral law. So we will be considering moral law, its importance, and how it's been neglected in our day. To give you an example, in 1946, in Winona Lake, Indiana Conference Grounds, the leading evangelist of North America met there for one week to discuss and try to solve one problem. And that one problem was, it was a very real problem, also a very important problem, but they never did get the answer in that whole week. And the problem was, why couldn't they see real conviction of sins in their evangelistic meetings the way that Charles Grandison Finney saw that in his day in the last century. Mr. Finney was a lawyer converted to Jesus Christ in 1821. And one of the main characteristics about his evangelistic meetings was that there was great conviction of sin and that he wasn't in any hurry about getting decisions or to get people to, quote, accept Christ. He laid down a panorama of truth to give the Holy Spirit of God something to work with so he can enlighten the minds of those that were without the faith as to how right, how reasonable, how wonderful, how intelligent the moral law of God is and how it would affect their lives. He was invited by the legal fraternity of that town. They had 41 lawyers, 42 lawyers really, including the circuit court judge. And he would lecture in the afternoon to the bar association, then preach that night in the Second Presbyterian Church when he left Rochester, the end of that revival, which lasted about six months, 41 of the 42 lawyers were converted to Christ, including the circuit court judge who had said to Mr. Finney in one of the afternoon sessions, Mr. Finney, you'll never get me to take the anxious seat. Now, Mr. Finney, when he started preaching to them, on the moral law, he would start with, what do we know? Otherwise, he'd do something like this about one of the commandments. He'd say, do you think it is right for a man whose wife needs an operation and he works hard, he pays his debts, he pays his tithe to his church, he saves his money to have his wife to be able to get this operation? And then a night or two before the operation, a robber comes in, holds them up, beats up the husband, takes all the money in the house, and does bodily harm to him. And he said he would point them out in the audience. You think that was right for him to do that? Oh, no. Everyone in there, when he point to him, ask him, you think it was right for that robber to do that? Oh, no, that's wrong. Well, he said, you know, God thinks that's wrong, too. He has a commandment, thou shalt not steal. He went through every one of the Ten Commandments and had the Bar Association agreeing that every one of the Ten Commandments was needed. Now, if you will listen to this series on the moral law of God, I think, if you'll take the same attitude that Mr. Finney did and that I'm going to take in giving this 
series. I think you can see, and if you'll do it and pray, you'll see great conviction of sin come again to our evangelistic meetings and the preaching in the local churches. So I would start with this very statement. When God created Adam and Eve, <clears throat> he created into the very centermost part of their being the right attitude and disposition of heart that dictated to them how they ought to act and react in every situation. I just said how they ought to act. We didn't make them act but enlighten their minds as how they ought to act and react in every given situation. You see, if you have a right attitude and disposition of heart, you'll honor your father and your mother. You won't steal from your fellow man. You won't use God's holy name in vain. You won't have other gods than him. And if you have that right attitude and disposition of heart that Adam and Eve were created with, you'll keep the Ten Commandments. That won't save you, but it'll be the evidence that you are, some of the evidence that you are saved. So they didn't have a system of law in the Garden of Eden for the simple reason they were made with the right attitude and disposition of heart that dictated to them how they ought to act and react under every given situation. But just to see if that would let God be God, if man be man, and plus the idea that man needed a moral governor. He gave them one teeny weeny law in the Garden of Eden. I've heard people say, well, I'm glad we're in the New Testament. I'm glad we're under the God of grace, not under the God of law. Well, they don't know the Bible very well when they talk like that because it's the same God in the New Testament was in the Old, and he changeth not. When it says he changes not, it means he doesn't change his character, his nature. Doesn't mean he doesn't change his mind. Every time he saves a sinner, he changes his mind. Because he has said, the soul that sinneth, that shall die. Every time a man repents, seeks the Lord Jesus, turns from his sin and is born again by the Spirit of God, God has changed his mind and given him new life in Christ whereas he was dead when he came to him. So God does change his mind. I'm so glad he changes his mind. There's something wrong with any mind. It can't be changed. So he's the same God in the New Testament. He was in the Old Testament. You were saved by grace in the Old Testament, and you're saved by grace in the New Testament. But he gave them the moral law for this reason, the Ten Commandments. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, broke that one law, which was, there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat thereof, for the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You know, along came Satan and said, go ahead and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for thou shalt surely not die, but you shall live. Well, he gave them a half-truth, one of the sad facts that we poor human beings is that when we're given a half truth, it seems we usually get a hold of the wrong half. There was a truth there. Their eyes were open, but they didn't become gods. He said, you shall become as gods. No, they wouldn't. And they got a hold of the wrong half. Their eyes were open. Now, just one little law, that's all there was in the garden. I say that's very, very lenient. How can they say he's hard, he's burdensome, he's rigid, he's a god of wrath? That's not to say it. There aren't occasions when people's conduct necessitates God to have a wrathful demeanor and do something about it, just like any parent with any sense. There comes a time you're supposed to have patience with your children all the time, but when children go too far, Anybody with any sense knows there's a time when patience becomes sin. And a person who really knows what he ought to know also knows that justice is an attribute of love. Very few people seem to know that. I'm so thankful I had a mother that would spank me, and so had my dad. And they only spanked me when I had it coming. The fact of the matter is, they didn't spank me a lot of times when I had it coming. 
for the simple reason they didn't know about it. But they stood for what was right and wrong, and when I did wrong to my brothers and sisters, they saw that justice was served, and I got the penalty for doing what is wrong because they're doing it for the greatest good of, of all the other children. I had 10 brothers and sisters, and you couldn't have one rebel doing what I was doing. So God is a God of love, but don't forget that justice is an attribute of love. Now, when Adam and Eve rebelled and sinned against God, they lost that right attitude and disposition of heart that they had been created with. That's a part of what it means that he, he looked at them and they were perfect and they were good. Without the good attitude and the right disposition of heart, they'd have been not much more than a piece of meat. Well, they lost that. And the further man got from the garden, they lost that right attitude. And they also lost what we would call an intuitive knowledge of right and wrong. That's knowledge of right and wrong that we're born with. And every person that enters this world, this is the light that lighteneth every man that cometh in the world. 95% of the people of this world that we have discovered so far in foreign missions, they have a system of moral law very, very close to the Ten Commandments. The reason that they have that is very simple, because they're born with it, they're made with it, and most people still have it if they haven't been educated away from it. Now, the more time that elapsed after the fall of man in the garden, the more they seem to lose that right attitude and disposition of heart. So one day God said to Moses, come on up here on Mount Sinai. We'll just put it down in writing how they ought to act. He went and talked to the elders of Israel about this invitation he has. Now I'm going to read it to you from the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, the 27th verse. You know the word Deuteronomy means a restating of the law. The Ten Commandments here in the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy are the same Ten Commandments we find that God gave in Exodus chapter 20. So this is restating, but this isn't carried back there like it is here. Here's the invitation. And then he tells them, he has this invitation, he says to them, what should I do? And here's the answer he gets from the elders. Go thou near, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. Speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. What I'd like to call to your attention is, they seem to know a lot about God when they didn't have the Old Testament in writing and the New Testament in writing that we don't seem to know, and we got both of those in writing now. That is that they knew their Heavenly Father, Jehovah, was so right, so reasonable, so amiable, and so wonderful, he'd never given them any laws or precepts that they couldn't do or that he wouldn't enable them to do. It's about time the church learns that today. What terrible attitudes and dispositions I have seen in Christian circles concerning the wonderful Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Listen to this again. They say to him, Go thou near, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. Now here is one of the copies of Finnish Systematic Theology, lectures on systematic theology. I would like to quote to you from page three of this fine book, what Mr. Finney has to say about obedience to moral law. I wish every preacher in this country and every Christian worker could hear these words and understand them and know the rightness and the reasonableness of them when he's, Mr. Finney said, to talk of inability to obey moral law is to talk nonsense. Inability means that 
you say that I can't keep the law, I can't do something. That is inability. Ability would be the possibility and the wherewithal you could do something. If you said you had an inability, that would say you didn't have the possibility of doing it or the, the equipment to do it. So he says, to talk of inability to obey moral law is to talk nonsense. Now here is a man accredited with being the greatest evangelist since the first century, and that is what he has to say about the wonderful moral law of God. Now that should carry some weight. Now for me, I could well understand. Most of you have never heard of me. I'll never see me, if you're lucky. But here's the greatest evangelist that's ever graced God's earth since the first century. And that is what he has to say. Now, Paul said he preached that all the world might become guilty before God. Now, if you preach, if you teach that man can't obey the law of God, then man is pathetic. He isn't guilty. But God would be unrighteous to demand something of you and me that would be impossible, especially on the pain of eternal separation from God. So you can never fault God there because it says in the Bible, all his ways are righteous altogether. So I think we begin, we'd better get into this subject and learn some things about it so we can begin to have a foundation for that kind of a right attitude toward the law that Mr. Charles Grandison Finney. Friends, the Ten Commandments did not create our obligation to God and one another. I split that between God and one another because the first four of the Ten Commandments are between ourselves and God. The last six are horizontal. They're between one another. Some people would preach a gospel that you can be right with man, but they leave out being right with God. And some people would preach that you can be right with God, but not be right with your fellow man. But the true gospel is both vertical and horizontal, that we get right with God and we get right with our fellow man. That's why restitution is often the great fruit of revivals. I know for 10 years after I was converted to Jesus Christ, I was still making things right with people. When the Spirit of God would bring them to my memory, things that I had done that weren't right. And I would go to people and I'd make them right. Like for instance, I had cheated my uncle Ora playing golf. I used a hand mash. I was, behind, I was behind a tree in front of the green. And I was not a good enough man at approaching, but I sure was at throwing a baseball, so I could sure throw a golf ball. And I used a hand mash. I threw it over the tree. I stopped about that far from the hole, and I hold out and won. He turned around and looked, and there I'm standing there holding a mashie. <laughs> now, that was deception. That was sin. When I came home from New York City and told my godly mother I had now become a Christian and I'd repented of my sins and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and sought him with all my heart. She said, that's wonderful, son. Now, what are you going to do about that time you cheated your Uncle Laura playing golf? Are you going to make that right? Well, I said to her now, because I'd had a little Bible school training, I said, now, Mama, you're not the Holy Spirit. That's right, but she was sure his little helper, I'll tell you that. And I, every time for the... Next several years that she saw me, she put the bee on me. What, what I, had I made that thing right? And she gave me no rest nor peace, nor did the Holy Spirit until I made it right. And I wrote that wonderful uncle of mine. His name was Ora Barnhart of Elgin, Illinois. And I confessed I cheated him. I told him I wasn't raised like that. It's wrong. It's a sin. But now I trusted Christ my Savior. And I want to make it, make it right. And I included the money in there that he lost that day. That's the last time I ever gambled with money. Wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was a principle behind it. I'm so glad I did that because he wrote me a wonderful letter about a week to 10 days later, and another week or so he died after that. In his letter, he told me, he said, now, Harry, I appreciate you confessing this and sending me the money, but I want you to know 
you keep on serving the Lord the way you're doing. He said, I knew the Lord when I was a young man, but I just didn't, I just didn't keep by it and let some other things get in my way. But you hold straight to the gospel. And I've tried to do that since that time. But that's making things right. Now, I said the Ten Commandments did not create our obligation to God or to one another. It merely defined what they always had been and they always will be. The Fifth Commandment says to me and to you, honor your father and your mother. And in some places it says that so shall your life be long upon this earth and so shall things go well with thee. I mean, the many wonderful things the Lord has given me to do since I've been trying to serve him now over 40 years was to tell me to honor my father and my mother. When I went home from New York City to tell my mother and to witness my dad, I wondered if he'd treat me the way he had treated her when she became a Christian. But I decided I was going to love him. I was going to love him and I was going to obey that daddy of mine as long as he didn't interfere with any law of God. He never asked me to interfere with any law of God. And I want to tell you something. I got a whole new dad out of it. Because, you know, love transforms its object. He and I became very close. I was the only man in the whole state of Indiana he'd ever go to hear preach the gospel. Now, as far as I'm concerned, my daddy, who was a great production engineering genius, he paid me a great compliment when he would come to the church in that town when I'd come home from New York City to speak for them. He would come and hear me, and I appreciated it very, very much. Now, honor thy father and thy mother. This is the first commandment with promise. I had a sister, still have her. Her name is Faith. A retired anesthetist, studied anesthesiology at the University of Virginia. First graduate, Wesley Memorial Hospital, now Northwestern University in Chicago. First graduate in anesthesiology or being an anesthetist. Well, she had two very serious cancer operations. And when she was 59 years of age, her health is in terrible shape. She wrote me a letter telling me that she didn't think she, in a nice way, in a guarded way. She had too much longer to live. I wrote her back a letter and I said, I've never known a young lady ever love, honored, and cherished her mother and father like you have. And I said, you're not going to die on the authority of the word of God because honor your father and your mother and so shall your days be long upon the earth. You haven't even gotten your three score and 10 yet. So I'm not worrying about you dying, and you take heart. And uh, I have a daughter, also named Faith, after her. And she was very worried here about something in her physical makeup, thought she had a terrible disease and would die, and I said to her, Now, Faithy, I couldn't have had nicer, more obedient daughters than you and Nancy, and you still are, and you're serving the Lord the best you know how, and in every way that people will let you. Sure, she knows a lot of things that people won't let her teach, but that's their funeral, not hers. But I said, Faithy, you have honored your father and your mother, and you so shall your days be long upon the earth. And it's been quite some time now since I said that to that girl. girl. See, it's the first commandment with promise. Now, friends, a moral law is a rule for action. A physical law is a rule of action. A moral law is a rule of things that ought to happen, that you ought to do. And by the way, if you want to have a right relationship with God, you have to do. I can show you that very plain in the Bible. The word ought should be, is a very poor translation of the word day, D-E-I, from which we get oughtness or ought. It's the same word as there, used there in John 3 when Jesus said, you must be born again. 
That's the same word translated ought in other places. In fact, 106 times in the New Testament. And there isn't anything optional about being born again, is there? So if you want to retain your relationship with God, right, you must, you must do these things. But if your relationship with God is right, you want to keep the law of God without even being aware of it and without even grinding at it. And it can become as natural to you to do what's right and good and reasonable and wholesome as it was for you to live in sin beforehand. Now, I would like to, for you to turn your Bible with me, and I'm turning to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, the 24th verse, the sixth chapter, the 24th verse. And the Lord is here speaking to Israel. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded. Now, I read the 24th and 25th verses, but there is something there that just jumps off that page at me every time I read this. And I've read it hundreds of times. I don't mean the whole Bible. But I do have a friend... Uh, uh, named Walter Maloon, he and his wife read the Bible through together out loud almost 25 times. It's no wonder to me it's become such a part of him. But when I read this, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, it's just what it says. It's for our good always. Because the laws are made in perfect accord with our nature. That's the original nature that man had. Oh, yes, the unconverted man has a sinful nature, but I don't mean perfect accord with that nature. That's a nature you shouldn't have. When you come to Christ, you're to be made partakers of the divine nature of Christ. But the reason sin bothers man, and the consequences are so bad, it's against our very nature, against the physical nature of man also, let alone the moral nature. So when I look at this for our good, I'm reminded of what I said in one of our previous lectures. I'm reminded of that yellow line you see in the middle of a two-lane highway when you're going up over a hill or going around a curve. It's on your side of the road, the yellow line and the dotted white line. You look at that and you stay on your side because it's dangerous for you to get the other side of the road. You wouldn't be able to get back perhaps if another car was coming. And you might have a wreck and hurt the people in the car coming, hurt yourself, hurt those riding with you and those behind you. And somebody may have spent up to three days to figure out where to start that line and where to end that line. And the state has your good, your goodwill at heart when they painted that line there. Well, that's the way the moral law of God is. It's for our good always. Well, I turn over in my Bible now to the 10th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. And I read now from the 12th and the 13th verses. Listen to this, if you will, please. Deuteronomy 10, 12 and 13. Now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, to keep the commandments, of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good, not intending to rob you of anything that's right, reasonable, practical, but to maintain your life and help you to maintain a right relationship with him and with your fellow man. And as I go on down in my Bible, I turn over a page to Deuteronomy 11. The 26th verse I read, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Otherwise, the commandments have sanctions with them. That's consequences. A law without sanctions is not law at all. It's mere advice. In the Ten Commandments, God is not giving advice. He is given laws. And so they have these commandments for our good always, but... The sanctions are to show us God's evaluation of the value 
of those laws. And the penalty usually fits a crime. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods you have not known. If you've read the history of the Israelites in the wilderness before they got in and even after the promised land, they didn't follow that. Even God said, Israel, I'm broken with your horse hearts. He'd, he'd do great things for him, and no more than turn his back if there is such a thing. And they'd be right back, having idols up on groves and worshiping false gods. And, and he said to them, I'm broken with your horse hearts. Now don't tell me you've got a God that's impassive, because the God of the Bible, he has feelings. Maybe you're a theologian. It says uh, they're anthropopathism, but I do not believe there's such a thing in the Bible. Because when God says he hates sin and he loves righteousness, and when he says, I'll joy over you that obey and I'll delight over you, I'll sing. If he doesn't joy and if he doesn't sing, if he isn't broken, then what is he? Then he cannot communicate with man. The words don't mean anything. I realize there's such thing as anthropomorphism where God is saying something to us to get across a spiritual concept but uses physical words to get across the concept. But I'm talking in the realm of the emotions and the mind now. And God says, I'll sing over you, and this is one of the great reasons to obey the law, friends. God's happiness is more important than ours. We should live to make the heart of God happy. A lot of people are breaking and giving him a bad time. But we ought to make sure we're going to live to make the heart of God happy. Now, I'd like for you to turn with me, if you will, now to Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. And I'd like to read from the 10th verse. And I'll read the next few verses. If thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments... And his statutes, which I have written in this book of the law. And if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, for this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, and in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. These Jews, not here nor any other place I've ever read in the Bible, have ever pled inability to obey the moral law. There's one place, I think it's in Acts 15, where Peter says, don't tempt God to put this yoke upon these Gentiles, which neither we nor our forefathers were able to bear. But that's talking about all the laws, 600 and some, that they had added to the moral law and made the moral law of none effect. That's the only time they ever did. But then they're, they're not talking about the wonderful Decalogue. They're talking about all these man-made ones, that they, such as you couldn't walk over a certain distance on the Sabbath. You don't find that in the scriptures. And some things you'll find in the Old Testament, you won't find in the New Testament. And the way to tell if there's a law in the Old Testament, is it verified in the New Testament? And if it is, then we're <laughs> under every obligation to obey that. And I find that every one of the commandments of the Old Testament are verified in the New Testament with the exception of one, and that one, it just changes the letter of it, but not the spirit. The spirit of the law is still there. So, if God gives us a law in the Old Testament, gives us certain advice in the Old Testament, the way to tell if we should obey that New Testament, he will verify it in the New Testament. And that is done time after time after time. Now, Notice here, they did not plead inability to obey the moral law. They say that the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. And down here they say, we will do it. 
Neither is there beyond the sea that thou shouldst say, Who shall go over for us and bring it unto us, so we may hear it and do it. It isn't that man can't obey the law of God. It is he won't. Now, if he won't, he's guilty. But if he can't, he's pathetic. Now, undoubtedly, there's a lot of men in this world that are pathetically guilty. But I'm speaking now primarily. And the gospel, friends, is not good news to the careless sinner. The gospel is only good news to the guilty sinner. And I believe when the law of God is preached correctly in its rightness and reasonableness, the blessed Holy Ghost will stand behind it and you'll see such great conviction of sin as you never dreamed. And you know why I can say that? Because I have seen it. I have not only seen it once, I have seen it several times to know that what Mr. Finney is saying in here is true. What, all you have to do is preach how right, how reasonable, how practical, how wonderful the blessed law of God is. And then the Holy Spirit will take that and show it to men that they could do it, but they didn't choose to do it. They chose to live for themselves supremely. Of course, you can't live for yourself supremely and still keep the law at the same time. But that's living for the flesh. You can't live for the flesh and the, thing, and the things of the spirit at the same time because they war against one another. But when it's preached right and reasonable, we don't need to tell them tear-jerking stories. We don't need to drag them oh, and dangle them over hell on Sunday morning for 20, 30 minutes. Just preach the wonderful law of God, what God's reasonable and requirements, how right they are. Look at this as I go on to read it. See, I've set before thee this day in life and good, death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in, in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgment, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it, that if thine heart shall turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I'll denounce you this day that you shall surely perish, that you shall not pro prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. And Moses then says, get this, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. God doesn't want anyone to choose obedience because in obedience there's death. They're going against the very nature of their design and their creation. Now I'd like to stop right here and cover something I should have covered in one of the previous lectures on the moral government of God. First in saying and asking and answering the question I've often been asked, why did God make man? Well, I'll tell you this. He didn't make man to glorify him. If he did, that'd be selfish. Our great God is not selfish. And if he did make us to glorify him, that's the only reason he sure got cheated in the deal. I'll tell you why God created us. Here's God made the heavens and the earth. He looked at it and it was good. But it had one serious limitation. It just obeyed the law of cause and effect and could bring no joy to the heart of God. So he said, I'll create man. Now I'll create man with a free will so he doesn't have to worship me. He doesn't have to let me be the God of his life. But when he gets real sense, gets real serious about things, he'll turn from his sin. He'll turn to the Redeemer. He will want to be right with me. And when he's in a right relationship with me, he will glorify me. But that is just one of the benefits. That is just one of the end results. Because here's God with all these great endowments of personality and character. He wanted to share them with man. And that's why he made you and me. And he made Adam and Eve. He wanted to share himself with man. And so that we'd be in such a tender 
cheerful, submissive relationship with him, that we'd walk with him and talk with him and be his obedient servants and enjoy the presence of him and his blessed spirit every hour of every day. And that was the reason that he created man, not to glorify him, but when we do get in a right relationship with him, we do glorify him. But he created man to share himself with. That's why he did it. Now, when you look at this and you look at it very closely, you can see that man has a free will. You know, or 4,000 times in the Bible, the Old and New Testament, it indicates very plainly that man has a free will. At least he was born with it. Now, I admit, you can throw your freedom away. I've hired many hundreds of engineers because I would ask them very serious questions for the simple reason we design big, complicated machinery, and when they don't work, People have a tendency not to pay for it. <laughs> now, you're not going to let an engineer be designing for you that has a problem with alcohol, if you can help it. It's broken many a firm. So I would quiz them about it. They'd say, oh, Mr. Khan, I drank, but I can take it or leave it. Well, I noticed pretty soon they're always taking it. They're always taking it. And I found then they start hiding it in the chandeliers. They'll hide it in the piano. They'll hide it in the flowers. They'll hide it under their drawing boards. They'll sneak into the men's room to take a little snip or nip. I've seen them then get a glass of water and they had to hold it with both hands like this or they'd spill it. And they even spill it then and they drink like that. Now I ask you, where is their freedom then? Where is their freedom? Well, I've said to you, that freedom exists only in proportion to wholesome restraint. Freedom without wholesome restraint leads to a license. License leads to bondage, and bondage evaporates freedom. Now, I turn over in my Bible to Joshua, the first chapter, and I'd like for you to read with me, if you would, the eighth verse of the first chapter of Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Well, that isn't the part that really thrills me about this verse, and I know many people have this on their desk, and I've seen it, and I'm not finding fault with that. But I'd like to read it again, and I'm going to stop at the word that seems to speak very loudly to me. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all. There it is. Now, why all? Because all of it is necessary and all of it is good, and all of it is right, and all of it is reasonable. Let's say I'm appointed the state highway director for this state, which means I have complete liberty of it under the governor to do. And so I, I say to him, now, governor, I like the laws we have in this land, but uh, I'd just like to change one, just one, well, he says, go ahead. Well, I change it. I just take all the lines out of the middle of the road, whether yellow or whether solid white, uh, inferring that you can go either direction on either side of the road. Can you imagine how many people would be killed down here in the state of Texas just in one day, let alone in one week, just because I've just gotten rid of one law? Now, if you're going to get rid of one of the Ten Commandments, tell me which one. Say every one of them is needed. Every one of them is necessary. And God doesn't give any more than what is necessary. And not a one of them, my friends, is our, rather arbitrary. They're all founded in the intelligence of God because he's the God of nature and nature is God. So he put it all together so he knows the nature 
of nature. And therefore, they're not against our nature. They're all necessary. And when he says to observe to do all according to all that is written therein, I think he's been very kind and very loving. I was raised in my father's factory, a machine shop. I can recall now many things he said to me in training me. I started on the broom. I can remember a year or two he gave me things very, very difficult to do. When you're 15 years old, you ought to try making a piston and make every operation on it when you're only 15 years of age. Well, he would stand right there beside me and he would not only tell me what to do, but he'd show me how to do it. And then he would help me to do that. And that's the way God is with the law. What he's given us to do, what God commands, God enables. God will help us. I can remember one time I had the job of putting the holes in a cylinder head. And I had done that to about 12, 22 cylinder heads a month before. Mind you, I'm just a lad in high school. And you had one flat surface, and then you put this jig on there, and you had to get it positioned right. And I said to my dad, Dad, would you help me? I've got the jig on here, but I don't remember how to locate this thing radially. And would you help me? He said, now, son, I told you that in June. I told you that in June. Now, what he's teaching me is, when I teach you, you listen very, very closely. I'm not just talking to hear my head roar. But then he went through it again very, very carefully with me. Many years later, in working for some very good men, it gave me some very, very involved things to do in engineering. I was glad my daddy taught me to listen very, very carefully. And one day I said to him, Dad, I'm only 15 years old. He said, Son, I'm your daddy. I know how old you are better than you do. <laughs> well, that's the way God is with us. He knows. And no, no temptation has taken us, but as such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will help us to overcome these things, to do them, and to perform what he would have us to do. So, I read now in the Bible here about a, Another young man, it was quite a young man, in having to do with the law. And I'm certain some of you know who he was. He's Ezra. Now read about him in the seventh chapter of Ezra, the tenth verse. And listen to what this says. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. You ought to look at those three verbs there very closely. This is what set him apart from those other people back there, that he now has a book in the sacred canon of scriptures named after him. You can find the reason right in these three verbs. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach it. To seek the law of the Lord. Otherwise, to learn to do it. Learn to obey it. Learn how important it is, how reasonable, how right, it, how wonderful it is. So he said he had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. One of, what a wonderful thing that he had said to him. Now, as I leaf through my Bible up here, the first psalm, I find that something says like this. Blessed is the man that walketh in the counsel, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Look what he delighted in. He didn't delight in who won the World Series, or who's going to win the NBA, or who's going to win the Indianapolis 500. 
Not that those things are wrong in themselves, but those should not be the things that we live for. Look what he delighted in. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. I perhaps have flown well over a million miles, and many times long flights over water, sometimes 11 hours at one crack. I've sat there. You'd think I was bored. No, I wasn't bored. I'd memorized a lot of these things here, and I'd hidden them in my heart, and I'd meditate on them, and the Spirit of God would give me things on these laws that I could never read any other place in the Bible. And that's what he's saying here. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Not 20 minutes on Sunday morning. Day and night. Otherwise, this word here, delight, I think is ruminate. Otherwise, to, to think, rethink, chew on it. Like a cow does her could. She'll go eat grass, and eat for half an hour and go over sat under a tree, then maybe chew or could over there for quite a long time. Well, I think that's what he's telling us that we ought to do here. And so I would like to turn now to the 18th Psalm. And uh, I want to give you something here that would be very, very helpful to many of you people. If you see it the way it should be seen. With the merciful, God says in the Psalm 18, 25th and 26th verses. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. But with the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the forward, thou show thyself forward. What that saying is, my friends, the trouble is most people, they see God in their own image. If you're a mean man, you're going to have a mean God. If you're a lackadaisical man, indolent man, you're going to have that kind of a God. And God will let you see him just any way you want to see him. But blessed are the pure in heart that love his law. He'll re reveal himself to those people how he really is. And we read in the 103rd Psalm that he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Most of these children of Israel, they just saw the cloud by night, the fire by, the cloud by day and the fire by night, and the manna on the ground in the morning. I'm afraid sometimes they didn't know much more, but Moses, God had made known his ways. Otherwise, how he thought, how he felt, how he looked upon certain things. This is why Moses, who was of all men most humble, and the Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the lowly. And later in the next tape, I'm going to talk about what grace is, and grace is a lot more than just unmerited favor. So, he knew him so well that he could pray to God, get God to change his mind, and God would change his mind. If you recall, when Moses came down from Sinai with the tablets of stone, the Israelites had a golden calf and they're praying and they're dancing around to this golden calf and it made him sick and made him sad and God came down and said grind up that golden calf and he made him eat it didn't he he said stand aside now Moses I'm going to mop up the earth with these stiff necked Jews and I'm going to make a new nation out of you it's a good thing he didn't say that to most of us we'd say no go ahead Lord now you got something to work with <laughs> no no if you read your Bible closely, you'll find that Moses got down and fasted and prayed 40 days and 40 nights, and he got God to change his mind. That's what the Bible says. There is God again changing his mind. Thank God for a God that changes his mind. So he had the petitions and prayer when he went to God because he, of all men, he was most humble. That's strange. He was the best educated man of his day. Those usually don't go together, do they? Humbleness and be the best educated man of his day. It does if the education's right. Because education shows a man how little he knows, not how much he knows. Because true education is really changing from the state 
of unconscious ignorance to conscious ignorance. And I hope in this lesson today, and we're going to, the next one is going to keep dealing with moral law. I think and I pray that many have seen that perhaps they've had the wrong attitude and the wrong slant on the wonderful law of God. And if you stick with me through this one and the next one, you'll find I'm using the law of God lawfully, as it says in 1 Timothy. Thank you.